my hope is to try and perhaps expand on this idea of owning and belonging and maybe push some boundaries in just a little bit. A year ago in December, I had a real uh, privilege. I had an opportunity to make a cooperative um, visit to Mecca. Now, does anybody know where cooperative Mecca is? Manchester. Well, actually, it's Rochdale, just north of Manchester, but that works. Um, I got the opportunity to visit 31 Toad Lane, which is the site of the original um, uh, Rochdale uh, store, uh, the uh, Rochdale uh, Equitable Pioneers, Society of Equitable Pioneers. And they've turned that into an international museum, and it was awe-inspiring. The entire side of that size of that store, take about four or maybe six of these tables, put them together, and that was their storefront. They had another room in, in back about the same size, maybe a hair bigger, um, but not much. They actually have preserved the same wooden, or excuse me, uh, stone flagstones on the floor that were there that the original cooperators walked on. It was quite impressive. I want to take, take three snapshots in time and then try and perhaps bring some relevance to the conversation we're having today here and in our co-ops at home. So I want to go back to 1840s England, a time of the Industrial Revolution and a great traumatic economic fracturing and restructuring. The weaving industry, which had heretofore been a bunch of individual weavers working in home, in home cottages and making livable wages selling their these hand-produced items into markets um, were being entirely dislocated by the advent of industrialization. Very large factories with looms, child labor, um, people, uh, uh, great unemployment as these folks are put out of, uh, put out of work as a result of these new machines. Um, tremendous economic destitution and challenge. And in that conversation, there was added on to it some other injustices that were created in the retail system. So for example, to, to get basic food, it was watered down butter. Plaster of Paris was mixed in with flour. Sawdust was mixed in with your oatmeal. And the scales were rigged. So this a whole idea of fair trading, in even just to get basic goods, was not, pre uh, was not present. And it required a bunch of people to come together and start talking. They started meeting in pubs which to me suggests that we ought to have a little more time of cooperation and belonging in pubs. Um, and they started talking about and trying to understand, so what was it about the cooperatives of that time, people trying to organize businesses together, what were the things that caused them to not be successful? And out of that comes the principles. To, our enduring, to their enduring legacy and to our enduring benefit, they created this whole idea around what do we need to do that's different. Because Rochdale was not the first cooperative. It wasn't the first time people tried to own assets together. But their contribution to us is this understanding about what is it that makes this model work. And so we have the principles as a kind of an owner's manual, if you will. Not as a checklist, not as a, uh, as a thou must or thou shalt. But this is the way the model works best, is when we educate our members and when we practice our open and inclusive opportunities for membership. These are the things that guide how the model can deliver the magic that the model delivers. And that's a, a, a pretty cute, uh, uh, critical thing. So now I want to fast forward 100 years. Now we're 1940s in America. And we've just come through a Great Depression and a Second World War. America is the only economy left standing in the, uh, in the world. Um, our isolation, our distance, has protected us and given us an opportunity to grow economically in ways that the rest of the world could not. And so for the next 50, 60 years, we experience a tremendous amount of wealth creation in this country, in part because we simply were, not because we necessarily or automatically were neat, nice people and democratic at the, at the same time. We had this ability to create wealth and security here that was not present for others. That wealth ended up giving us options that we didn't have before. And so we started doing things like moving our front porches and making them into backyard decks. It gave us the opportunity to have more than one car, and so we didn't have to commute or take public transportation. We could all drive separately to work. 
we could buy washing and dryers, washing machines and dryers, so the women didn't have to talk to their neighbors over the backyard as they're hanging up wash on the line. We begin a period that drives a whole lot of isolationism and a whole lot of period of uh, a sense of everybody can make it, we all got it, and, all we, and we can do it all by ourselves. This individualism and a sense of isolationism that comes out of that. And now from that period, I want to bring you to today, again in America. We've lived through the second Great Recession. We have discovered that in an era where, again, technology has completely disrupted our ability to um, do work in the old ways, only this time it's measured with electrons and computers, we have the almost instantaneous, well, we do have the instantaneous mobility of information and the instantaneous mobility of capital, and we can't move goods instantaneously, but pretty damn fast. And out of that comes this opportunity for um, great translocation. What does any of that have to do with us? I suggest to you that our principles as cooperative businesses gives us an insight and an opportunity today that is just as relevant and just as meaningful as to the Rochdale Weavers, and just as necessary for us as cooperators to share and live our values, our principles, and to adopt them as our ways of, uh, yes, gaining competitive advantage and living out the values that we seek to be incarnate in the world. That work matters. For those of you who are boards and, and managers, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to drive those principles deep down into our organizations, not just at board conversations, but throughout our membership, so that we share values and grow communities that continue to be based on values, because that's the way that we cement the values for another generation, to move that forward, and to learn that we can do things together and achieve things with great success. My one hope or vision that I would throw out to you, the question that was posed for us today is, what would that look like in our co-ops? I'm going to ask you, what would that look like in American democracy if we as cooperative leaders learn to practice this, build trust, engage people in our cooperatively owned businesses authentically, honestly, with trust? And what if we start learning how to bring that back into our shared civil life, our common life, whether it's taking care of our parks in a local, and our streets in a local community, whether it means our state, whether it's our nation, whether it's leadership that transcends itself into the world. All of that becomes possible, but I believe it starts with our understanding, our shared discussions, and our shared authentic practice of these conversations around owning and belonging.